All right, this is the book of Acts, the Acts. All right, 28 chapters. 28 chapters. 1,007 verses. 1,007 verses. Twenty-four thousand two hundred and fifty words. Twenty-four thousand two hundred and fifty words. Approximate uh, time of writing sixty-five A.D. Although you may get some differences from some of them. The author is Luke. Now, before we start, Luke. Where? Be no way to tell for sure. Most of them say he's a minor. Nearly all the writers will say he's a minor for the writing of three quarters of the New Testament. For the exception of the Pauline epistle, they put all Asia minor. Except just maybe one or two, maybe James and Matthew and Jerusalem. The rest of them all Asia minor. All right, now, before we get in this book, I'm going to show you some checkpoints in this book <clears throat> to check any translation out on. And when you pick up any translation, there are certain checkpoints in the book of Acts you check it by. The first of these is Acts 1-3. Acts 1 3. That's a checkpoint. All right, see if they'll translate the word hell in Acts 2 31. We'll translate the word hell in 2 31. See if they'll translate the word when in Acts 3 19. The word when, when in Acts 3 19. <coughs> see if they'll translate the word child. In Acts 4.27, the word child in 4.27. See if they'll translate the word God in 7.59. The word God in 7.59. It's infallible. For Acts 1.3, the word is infallible. All right, to see if they include Acts 8.37. Acts 8.37. See if they include Acts 9.5-6. See if they'll translate Easter, Acts 12.4. See if they'll translate Easter, Acts 12.4. See if they'll translate Jupiter. Acts 14.12. Jupiter. Acts 14.12. See if they'll translate Christ. Acts 16.31. Christ. Acts 16.31. See if they'll translate the verse correctly in Acts 17.23. Acts 17.23. See if they'll translate Jupiter, Acts 19.35. Jupiter, Acts 19.35. And the greatest verse in the uh, book of Acts, the deity of Christ, is Acts 20.28. 20, Acts 20.28. 20, Always check them on that one. And then check them on the uh, reading on Acts uh, 26. 28. Acts 26, 28. Well, it's uh, every one of those places I showed you, uh, the deity of Christ or advanced revelation or prophecy or conversion. And every one of them has been changed, every Bible in the market. Who's ever putting out those Bibles is, a con is against the conversion of sinners and the second coming of Christ and the deity of Christ. Infallible proofs, infallible proofs in the resurrection. The word has been changed in every Bible in the market. No scholar believes anything is infallible except himself. So they've taken the word out. All right, now the next thing notice about this book. In the King James Bible, this is called what? Oh, that's the correct title for the book. The book is The Acts of the Apostles. And the reason why that's so important is because People who are trying to prove apostolic authority are always going to the book of Acts. Always. 
not remembering that they're not apostles. Now, there, there are two groups that will base their theology in the book of Acts, and both those groups are after you to talk you out of your salvation. And the way that thing works is this. The first man to ever try to prove apostolic authority was the Pope. And the Holy Pope at Rome, the Pope, he said, I get my apostolic authority from the Vicar of Christ, the Prince of Apostles, Simon Peter. Right? Matthew chapter 16, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. All right, who's preaching in Acts 2? Peter. Peter. Everybody wants to go back to Simon Peter. Everybody. Because that's the wrong place to go back to. Simon Peter was circumcised Jew under the law, and he's not given the mystery of the revelation of the church. He's not given the mystery of the revelation of anybody in Christ. He's not given the mystery of the gospel of the grace of God. Not a one. So every heretic in this country is going to go to Simon Peter. All right, Simon Peter has his authority in two places. Matthew 16 and Acts chapter 2. Oh, All right, there are going to be three kinds of people after you. Uh, and these people can best be given in this fashion. And you might add two more if you want a good message. I don't know. They just all do. And uh, the communists based their doctrine in Acts 4. They shared everything and had everything in common. The Catholics come back in here in Matthew and get you on there, and the Camelites and Charismatics come in Acts 2. Now, here's what the Bible says about you if you're saved. What? Know ye not your body is the temple of what? The Holy Ghost. Why, well, the Holy Ghost is in your body. Now, there are going to be two people going to try to talk you out of that. And the reason why they're going to try to talk you out of it is so that you won't live the life God wants you to live. If you can ever lose the consciousness of the Holy Spirit in your body, you're going to not care how you live as a child of God. As long as you're conscious of the fact that the Holy Ghost is in you and your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, you're going to live different than you would otherwise. So the devil's big trick is to talk you out of believing the Holy Spirit in you. Now, you know, by two ways. First of all, he'll tell you this. If you're not baptized according to Acts 2.38, you don't have the Holy Ghost. Why? Repent and be baptized every one in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right? Right. Right? Or right. then if you're not baptized according to Acts 2.38, you don't have the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that's the teaching of the Church of Christ, called the Catholics. Or uh, the other one is the charismatic will come in Acts 19, and say, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Now that's based so that when you believe on Christ, you didn't get the Holy Ghost. You got the Holy Ghost later, see? And the proof on this one here is you don't have the Holy Ghost unless you talk in tongues. You don't have the Holy Ghost unless you're baptized in water. But I talk to those people, I tell them, what are you trying to give me? And they say, what do you mean? I say, you're trying to tell me something. What have you got that's better than what I have? But I like great fires and great humble. I say, oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Well, so what are we talking about then? I said, I've got something you don't have. <laughs> and a lot of people think I'll get him for this photo. And they say, what, what? I say, absolute assurance of salvation, the presence of the Holy Spirit, put out the Lord's baptism more than Amen. 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 I've got something they don't have. So they afford to listen to me. Amen. Amen. They got nothing off of me. They say, well, this and that, they have nothing off of me at all. I've got what they don't have. I have assurance I have the Holy Spirit without either of those things. But then I have to apply that to say, oh, and any better than you do, because they've been taught not to make that profession. And actually, they believe they do. And the truth will know, see, but I'm not going to tell the truth about it. All right, so in the book of Acts, is a stumbling place. That's a stumbling block. Now, to get to Acts chapter 19, you'll find nobody there is a New Testament. Christian, nobody has been born again, nobody has believed on Christ, nobody has been saved, nobody has been circumcised, nobody has trusted the finished work of Christ. There is anybody in Acts 19 where he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe me? Does Matthew, anybody in this room or anywhere, any, any Christian ever lived? Nobody. 
But you only get that by studying the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, there are no Christians. The Christian way in Acts chapter 2. You couldn't find a Christian Acts 2 with a flashlight. Where does the first time the word Christian show up in your Bible? Acts 1. Take your Bible turn to Acts 11, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a nice way out of it. Of course, you can say, well, sure, all you people are Romans. You all came out of the Roman Empire. I mean, you know, ask the fool according to his folly. Or right, Acts 11, verse 26, the end of the verse. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, not Jerusalem. Not Acts 2, Acts 11, Antioch of Syria, a Gentile city. A Gentile city. There are no Christians in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There certainly are in the Acts 19. Those are fellows in Acts 19 were baptized in the ministry of John the Baptist. Yes. Why would they have been why would they have been Christians? Where would you get the word from? Why wouldn't they be called flobbledoodles? <laughs> See? I mean, why wouldn't they call meatheads? Why why were they called Christians? <laughs> what? They weren't called Christians to write then. That's the point. Oh, I didn't say they weren't saved. I didn't say they weren't saved. I didn't say that. I said there are no Christians in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now, I see why I'm saying that. Because these people are always trying to teach you Acts 2 as Christian doctrine, Right? Well, it's heresy. There are no Christians there. Yes. Well, I, I was showing how the Pope wants to get authority. People who want authority always go to the apostles to prove apostolic authority. Many of these up here. Yes. Any born again believers? Not a one of them, man. They had no new birth till the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2. All right, that's where first period, right? Mm hmm. What would you call them then? Every single one of them is a circuit, is a circumcised, Sabbath observing, pork abstaining, bearded, temple worshiping Jew. They ain't a Christian in the bunch. Separated from Christian? Sir? Separated from your Sabbath. There is any Christian in Antioch where the disciples are first called Christians that is a Sabbath observing, temple worshiping Jew because there's no temple there. You've got to get the difference. All right, turn to Revelation 2 in one hand. Get 2 Corinthians 12 in the other. Yes. What's the difference between Peter being converted? Peter being born again by the Spirit. In other words, was he converted before Acts 2 and then he was born again by the Spirit after Acts 2? Well, he believed the whole That's true, but of course, when you get in there, you get in, a, in the situation between the resurrection and Acts 2. Yeah. He could have been converted in there. But again, we have trouble, because as soon as you say converted, the person who doesn't know their Bible thinks, oh, that means receiving Christ the Savior. In Simon Peter's case, it wouldn't. He received Christ in Matthew chapter 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, without receiving him, because he hadn't yet died. And after he died, Mary rose from the dead, he received him without receiving him, because the body hadn't yet been formed. At Acts chapter 2, when the body was formed, he'd already received him, and the Holy Spirit came automatically. <laughs> See? I mean, you talk about a mess, man. You get in between Matthew 22 and Acts 2, and boy, you got trouble. 
Now, let me show what you can be clear of. Revelation 2 in one hand, 2 Corinthians 12 in the other. Revelation 12 and Acts chapter 2. Did you ever stop to think what a man could do with the book of Acts? <laughs> you want to? 2 Corinthians 12, Revelation 2. <laughs> Did you ever stop to think what a man could do if he wanted to? I mean, suppose I want to screw you up, Joe, you never get over You know what I teach you? I teach you a man that's saved by grace through faith without war baptism or tongues. The dying feet. Right? Right, right. I teach you father to save by grace through faith, but you thought the Lord was going to baptize without a tongue. Acts 16. I teach you father to save by grace through faith, but he talks in tongues when he's saved before he's baptized in water. Acts 10. But I teach you father to save by grace through faith, but he talks in tongues when he's not saved till he gets baptized in water. Acts chapter 2. Then I teach you the guy is saved the grace of faith by believing and baptized, but doesn't get the Holy Ghost until after he's been believed and baptized, Acts chapter 8. Yeah. Now I just give you six ways to get saved. And none more. <laughs> none more. The single one of those things, that's Christian doctrine as it stands. And all I'm doing is just messing around the book of Acts. That's all I'm doing. Every heretic in this world would go to hell in Acts 2 before he go to heaven on Ephesians 2. All right, Revelation chapter 2. Now, the way that thing comes, your tongues movement, see? Dave Wilkerson got a lot of boys converted that uh, had no education, couldn't read or write. Now, the Lord may have given them something to take care of their carnal faith until they could read and write. I don't say he didn't. Many young man that's been on dope has had some kind of experience in tongues because his nervous system was shot. Some of them went blind. They couldn't have read a Bible anyway. So what God does, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not denying it couldn't happen. What I'm saying is, where you find that thing starting up, it always comes in a situation where the person was dependent entirely upon their feelings before they received Christ. Now, they may have needed something to get them off dope. And maybe that little shot in the arm got them off dope. So I'm not, I'm not denying it. See, I'm not saying God couldn't do something like that and then use it to, for his own good, see? But, boy, you teach our stuff as Christian doctrine. That's something else. All right, Revelation 2, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Now, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Underline it. Truly the signs of an apostle. Right? Right? The signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Paul was an apostle. You know how he proved it? He had the signs. Every man that wants to prove his authority tries to prove he's an apostle, and therefore he's got to prove he has the signs, or he can't claim to be an apostle. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. Yes. Signs, that I believe, over in Mark. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And they shall speak with other tongues. That's the signs. That, that's the signs. Revelation 2, 2. I know thy works, thy labor, and thy patience. How can not thou can not bear them which are evil? And thou ascribe them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So you better look out for some that claims to have the apostolic signs and can't produce them. But why do they have to have signs? I just the way to prove the apostle is making produce the signs. Because in Revelation 2-2, it doesn't say how they try them. Well, that'd be the way to try them. Well, I agree. Sure. There ain't, there ain't way to... Say, show them to me. Tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but them that believe not. I've got an unsaved Jew here. Give him the sign. Mark, when you, when tongues are for a sign for those who believe, not for them that believe, but for those who believe not. Right. All right. Well, then, uh, um, um, Give me, give me an example. You better look at that again. There's a, those, those, those twelve spoke, and they spoke in tongues for a synagogue. They didn't believe the Gentiles received the Holy Ghost. That was a sign there for the Jew who didn't believe something. 
He didn't believe the Holy Ghost could be given to a Gentile. Now, <laughs> you all off to a flying start, aren't you? Oh. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, he might. So I try the spirits, or say, now I'll tell you how it happened. I'll show you one way it happened. A fellow, a couple of guys, Bob Jones Sr. called up to his office one time, and he said, uh, you fellows got the charismatic gifts? Yeah, yeah. What gift you got? He said, I got the gift of tongues. Said another kid, what gift you got? He said, I've got the gift of prophecy. Said another kid, what you got? The kid said, I've got the gifts of uh, healing. And old man said, I got a gift too. I'm charismatic. I got a gift. And they said, What's your gift? He said, My gift is the sermon of spirits. And he said, I discern you're on the devil. You know, and get out, see. You can give it that way, all kinds of ways to give it. Yeah, yeah they're claiming Mark 16. Yep. Yeah. Try this. First, you show the sign, put your finger right in the face, and say, You unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of him. Watch him lose his cool. Do <laughs> you ever have one of these fellows come around and give you this? But brother, yes, brother, God bless you, brother. We're praying for you, brother. And I know how you feel about it. I know you think you're right, but we love you, brother. And we'll be praying that God will just give you what he's given up. God bless you, you know. And you know what to do when they do that? Push your arm out and say, I love you, brother in the Lord, praise God. And I'm praying for you every day. God will give you something real. And so I know God has given you the least gift, and I'm thankful for you. He's, in his mercy, has seen fit to give you the smallest thing he can give you. And I'm praying that someday he'll give you something good like he's given us. The Lord bless you, brother. And you watch that bird just turn inside out. You watch him lose his love and his concentration and his dedication just that quick. You know why? Because he's made a God out of his gift. You can tell real quick. Sir? Yeah, just trying spirits. All right, now the Acts of the Apostles. That's what it's about. Now, if you want to know why some people talk in tongues who are not apostles, it's because the tongues are around while the apostles are around. The healing is there while the apostles are there. He says, these signs shall follow them that believe. See? So long those apostles are working, those signs follow the apostles. So when you're the Acts of the Apostles, you're dealing with those signs. Now let me show you something that may convince you. Turn to John just a minute. Let me show you a real wild one. Uh, get John chapter uh, 14, I think it is. Might be 15. I want the promise that says, uh, and greater works. Well, what is it? John 14, 12. 14, 12. Oh, here's a good one. Now look at this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, does that include everybody? Yes, sir. How many say yes? Let me see your hands. How many say no? Let me see your hands. He that believeth on me. Does that include everybody that believes on him? How many say yes? Let me see your hands. How many say no? Let me see your hands. How many don't know? Let me see your hands. All right, 12. Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. There's a foundation thing for healing and everything else. And greater works me shall I do because I go to my Father. Now, do you, how many of you believe on Christ? Let me see your hands. Would you mind standing up and telling us what you've done that's greater than Jesus Christ did? My, what sudden humility. What an attack of humility. <laughs> and when I pulled out a bunch up in Memphis, a guy said, well, it's because I just don't have enough faith to believe the promise. Well, then it's not for you if you don't have enough faith to believe it. You know what it said? It said, he that believeth on me. It doesn't say he that has faith in that promise. He said, he that believeth on me. I said, I thought stand up and tell what work she'd done. He said, well, if God led me to do some work, I could greater. I said, wait a minute. It didn't say you, fella. It said he did believe it. Any of you ladies ought to be able to do greater than Jesus Christ. 
Anytime. If it's for you, right? Right? Is it right? I mean, he that believeth on me. Well, now, you see how folks get messed up? Now, let me show you something. Let me show you something. 14.1. Watch this thing. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. <laughs> Who's he making that appeal to? Saved people or lost people? What? Well, right the, you're not in the past. He's talking to the 11 apostles. <laughs> not wild. Now, you see how people get messed up? You believe in God, believe also in me. They didn't believe him in the sense they should have. They didn't. Let's see if they did. Verse 7. If you had known me, implying they didn't, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip saith to him, Lord, show us the Father, and sufficeth us. Jesus said to them, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me do the words. Believe me. So the appeal, believe me. Twelve. Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, he's talking to those apostles. And the works they did uh, were greater than he, than he did. He raised dead people, they raised dead people. He didn't talk in tongues, they did. He didn't heal anybody by a shadow passing over him. Peter would heal him by the shadow coming over him. Jesus didn't heal anybody by an apron or handkerchief getting laid on him. Paul did. But that's apostolic, you see that thing? Now, when you give a new Christian he says, Oh, I've just been claiming that promise. Why? Why? Why have you been claiming that promise? Did you ever have one of those things? Why would a Christian grab that one? Power, boy, authority. See, me. That's the fleshy Christian. See, the works that Christ did, I can do. And greater. <laughs> See? You know what old John said? John said, he must increase and I must decrease. All right, Acts chapter 1. Are you ready for the book of Acts? <laughs> okay. The Acts, eh? X-E. <laughs> The Acts of the Apostles. <laughs> All right, chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise. Then whoever wrote this wrote something ahead of time. Notice before, former. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. All right, come back to Luke 1. There's only one other former that starts out this way. Luke chapter 1, verse 3. In Luke chapter 1, verse 3, the writer is Luke, and he addresses the same man. Luke 1, 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things in the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. See, Luke? Now, there's another way you know this book is written by Luke. Come over here late in the book and pick up about chapter 27, and notice the writer of the book writes in the first person, Acts 27, 1. Whoever write, is writing the book of Acts is with Paul. Acts 27, 1. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul. Verse 3. And the next day, we touch at Zidon. 5. And when we sail over. So whoever writing that book wrote another book before he wrote that to a man named Theophilus. He writes this to Theophilus, and he's traveling with Paul. All right. 2 Timothy 4. Notice that Luke is the only one that stays with Paul right to the end. 2 Timothy 4, verse 11. 2 Timothy 4, verse 11. At the end of his life, only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. All right. Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and the author is Luke. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments, underline it, unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Those commandments of sign and wonder were given to the apostles, so they follow the apostolic ministry. And the reason why they want to kid you into thinking they have them is because then you'll think they are apostles. 
and they're not. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. Old English, really strong feeling. Now our turn right now is only in the sense of lust, or something in regards to sex. But the term originally meant a strong feeling of any kind. And a strong feeling of any kind is, is a term of a passion. Yes. Yes. No, he sure didn't. Yeah, in uh, Hebrews 10, no man taketh it honor to himself, but he that is called of God is Aaron. No man can set himself up as a priest. I don't know who Theophilus is. He's just a friend of Luke. Had to be what? No, you don't have to be saved to speak in uh, tongues or heal. Turn to Revelation 16. I'll give you two classes of unsaved people who have the charismatic gifts. The first are unsaved uh, prophets, and the other are demons. Revelation 16, verse 13. Revelation 16, 13. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, the mouth of the false prophet, for they are spirits of devils working miracles. Working miracles. Matthew chapter tw- uh, 7, yes? Would that be good for us to prove that uh, white witchcraft or uh, a good form of God does uh, good gifts is not of, or is of the devil also? Or is there a better person? I had a guy asking that. The, be- the best one would be uh, Acts 19 or Acts 16, where the demon possessed woman is following Paul and saying, Thee, the servants of the Most High God, true, which show us the way of salvation, true and good. And he turns around and casts the devil out of her for telling the truth. That's the best one. Or in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Verse 23, they're lost. They're lost. Yes. All that, a lot of this pious stuff, they're just demons crawling all over them. Brother, Brother Baker has a problem over in Andalusia. You need to pray about that. Remember that group we had here doing the swing and the singing one night? Well, evidently, they run the church, and uh, they're going to run it. And the song service, that fellow's preaching the whole time and, and giving Baker what's left. And uh, everybody in town evidently knows that he's been running the church and running off the preachers. So Baker's having a real time over there with him trying to get things taken care of. And he's talking about how pious that fellow is, you know, praying and Lord saying, Lord, you know this church is not what you want it to be. And we pray this church will be what you want it to be, you know. And Baker has been over there now oh, about eight or nine months, and he's gone by his house uh, six times and tried to get him to go make some calls on visitation, going right by his house, and the guy won't make a call anywhere. That's just all a bunch of pious bunk and that stuff. Acts 1. Acts 1, verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, underline it, by many infallible proofs. Any book that leaves out infallible is, is nervous about the authority of the Word of God. And a thing that's infallible is something that's absolutely true and cannot be disproved. Something that's beyond uh, controversy. When Christ rose from the dead, he showed himself by many infallible proofs. He ate. That's pretty good proof. He talked. He sat down with people. He walked with them. He fellowshiped with them. He cooked for them. Uh, how many people did he appear to? Over 500. Many infallible proofs. Being seen of them 40 days. That's pretty good proof, isn't it? I mean, 40 days, man, what do you want? It isn't somebody having a hallucination. Oh, I thought I saw him. I mean, it's 40 days eating and drinking and talking with him. And how you doing? Oh, it's fine. How you doing? Good to see you again. It's 40 days. 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, he taught them for 40 days. Taught them. 
and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now that kingdom of God he's talking about there is the second coming. We know this from Luke 19. Turn to Luke 19 and notice how the kingdom of God here is not a reference to the church age. Luke 19, 11. The church age is revealed to Paul, and when Christ rose from the dead and talked with the apostles, he didn't tell anything about the mystery of the body. Not a word. Second Advent. Second Advent. Luke 19, 11. And if they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And he said, A certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so he comes back in verse 15, having received the kingdom. Now again, can't all things the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, but just very briefly, when God makes pattern, he king of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. When he falls, he loses the kingdom of God. All you have to do is the kingdom of heaven, 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 the kingdom of heaven. supernatural body? See that? Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God together. Right, it's going to be right over in here. Now, the kingdom of God he's talking about in Acts 1 is that kingdom showing up. The kingdom of God Paul talks about is this one over here, into which man is born. But except a man be born again, he cannot see, 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 see the kingdom of God. And if he's not born again, he cannot enter, 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 enter. The kingdom of God. See the two of them? You enter here, you see it there. Yes. Uh huh. That, that's pretty rough. Pretty rough. Matthew 26 to Acts 2. That's the bloody one. Matter of fact, in there, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That's the rough one. Acts 26 to Acts 2. Uh, that's, that's the bad one. Matthew 26. What kind of inheritance does a person get in the kingdom of God? Now, I don't think he gets an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven, which would be a, a literal, visible, physical yep. inheritance. But since the kingdom of God is spiritual, well, the whole thing there is the kingdom of God shows up. Although you may get control over physical things, you're no longer physical. You're supernatural. So for you, it's spoken of as the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, the term kingdom of heaven is never spoken of in relation to your inheritance. Not a time. Kingdom of God now, Acts 1-3 is speaking about after the battle of Armageddon going into the millennium. Yes, yes, I can have that. Or Acts, yes. In Matthew 26 and Acts 2, it's rough. Yes, it is. Now, I'll tell you why it's rough. The atonement's completed and nobody knows about it. You can eat pork, but nobody would dare eat it. The Holy Spirit has come, but he hasn't come like he is now. And they're saved, but they're not in the body, and they're saved, and they're not part of Christ. you got a first-rate mess between Matthew 26 and Acts 2. Do you have an answer for John 20, 21, about the Christ that received the Holy Ghost? Did they receive or did they not receive? Well, it's it taken for granted they did. <laughs> but look at here. I say, receive the Holy Ghost. Poof. <laughs> Okay, then, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down and places him into a body where the head's up there. That's the difference. 
That's a difference. Bound to be a difference. Now, you see what they'll do to you? They'll say, well, have you received the Holy Ghost? Poof. <laughs> Since you believe, it won't work. When you believe on Christ over here, the Holy Spirit comes into your body, baptizes you into Christ, circumcises you, cuts you loose, completes the atonement. It's done. It isn't done between Matthew 26 and Acts 2. So if a guy's going to get you messed up, he's going to go right back in there every time to do it. I suppose so. <laughs> I won't do. Oh. Uh, You know, in that sense, you could say in that sense. But look at the other sense. Here's Peter stand here and the Lord stand here. Whew, receiving the Holy Ghost. Peter's still over there and the Lord's still over here, right? That didn't want to happen to me. When I got saved, I got in him and he got in me and I'm part of him and he's part of me. It's a different thing. Now that isn't all. When Christ says, whew, receive the Holy Ghost, he going to deal with that fellow right in front of him. He's dealing with more than that now. And that isn't all. When he says that, his body is down on the ground, and when he does it now, his body is up at the right hand of the Father. Boy, it won't come through. There's, he says, study to show yourself approved. There's a difference. There's a difference. When his body is up there, what kind of... How is now, we've got to get back <laughs> Acts, brother. <laughs> Acts 1, 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Now when they hear it, turn to Luke 24. Here's the promise they heard from him. Luke 24, verse 49. Luke 24, verse 49. And behold, Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. All right, the first thing about the promise of the Holy Spirit coming is, number one, it's a promise. Number two, it is an endowment of power. Now, because of that, uh, John R. Rice and R.A. Torrey and some of the rest of them counsel you to get a Pentecostal experience, not for salvation or not for eradication, but for an endowment of power. So yes, that's where that thing came from. All right, back to Acts chapter 1, verse, uh, verse, verse 5. What time is it? Is our time up? Hey, well, well, we don't have plenty of time. We'll have to close here in verse 5. Thanks so much for background. I forgot to tell you something else. <laughs> the time these events took place is no New Testament. Nobody here has a New Testament. Nobody in Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 has any Bible at all but a Genesis to Malachi. Verse 5, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. All right, that first thing there is also given as a baptism, as a promise, as a doing of power, and as a baptism. That thing right there. At Pentecost. Yes. All right, he wrote Luke before he wrote Acts, right? He said Luke was the former trace. Mm -hmm. So didn't they have the book of Luke around there? No, not the time these things took place. The time they took place, nobody has anything. Oh, I see. He's writing it. You know. Yeah, the difference between the fellow recording what took place and what they were doing that, you know, when took place. All right, now look at verse 5 very carefully. A hundred dollars, you can find the word fire anywhere in the verse. Does anybody get baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire? So no fire there. Turn to Acts chapter 2 and look at verse 3 and notice there's no fire there. Acts chapter 2 verse 3. There appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire. Not fire. One more shot. Acts 2 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, Acts chapter 2, that baptism is a promise and a new of power, a baptism and a filling all at one time. And you can see how screwed up both get on. There wasn't much of folks saying, well, we ought to be filled with the Spirit. 
That's true. But when they're filled with the Spirit in Acts 4, nobody talks in tongues. Here's some of the simple things that ought to be an endowment of power. There are many people get talking in tongues that quit winning souls and spend the rest of their life trying to get other Christians to talk in tongues. That is the power. And that's not a doom of the power. And other people say, well, it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Every Christian is baptized by the Holy Ghost according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. By one spirit are we all baptized in one body. Amen. So if you want to get messed up, just come in there. Now the last one is Tarry, Jerusalem, the promise come upon you. Somebody says Pentecost is not a denomination, it is an experience. That's a blatant, bold-faced, dirty lie. Pentecost is a Jewish feast. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You know it's so. Leviticus chapter 23, Pentecost is not an experience for anybody. Pentecost is a Jewish feast. And that is all. The next time it came, nobody talked with tongues. The next time it came, nobody talked with tongues. And there have been 1,934 Pentecosts since Acts 2, where nobody talked with tongues. And nobody waited, and nobody tarried, and nobody got any promise. There have been 1,934. And if you ask the average Pentecost when Pentecost was, he couldn't even tell you. Couldn't find an account. Pentecost is not an experience. Pentecost is a Jewish feast, and that's a dirty lie, a lie about God's book that way. You have no business lying about the Word of God that way, and be sure you're settled by God. <laughs> amen, 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 and amen. And you're welcome, Mike. Help you again, let me know. <laughs> all right, that's all for tonight. Now, at the time these events take place, there's no New Testament. There's no Matthew, no Mark, no Luke, no John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are written much later. So at the time of the events take place in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, there is no New Testament. All they have is Genesis to Malachi. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now, notice two things that I've called your attention to before. The first one is that this baptism is a promise and a filling and an endowment of power. Did you write that down last time? It's four separate things happening at one time. Now, there's something else wild about this scene. A filling, a promise, an endowment of power, and a baptism, all occurring at one time. Now, there's another thing that's peculiar about this. At this time, the local church at Jerusalem is the body of Christ. 
in Acts 2. Every member of that local church is saved. They're all saved. And when the Holy Spirit comes down and baptizes that bunch of people, it takes that bunch of people and puts that bunch of people into Christ. And let me show you where that's found. Come over here in uh, Acts chapter... Uh, oh, let's see. Acts chapter 5, verse 14. Acts 5, 14, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. So if the perfect place to get screwed up and stay screwed up is Acts 2. Because I don't suppose there's not another time in the entire Bible where that thing ever takes place that way. And when people confound the local church with the body, they're confused in Acts 2. When they confound the endowment of power with the baptism, they're screwed up in Acts 2. Where they confound the filling with Pentecost, they're messed up in Acts 2. Acts 2 is the perfect place just to go clean off your noodle and just stay off the rest of the time. Because it doesn't ever happen again that way anywhere. John baptized under the tongue, right? Yeah. John's disciples? Evidently. Yeah. Evidently. All right, Acts chapter 1, 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire not many days hence. It doesn't say that. I added two words. I added two words a lot of people add. Nobody is baptized with fire in Acts chapter 1, chapter 2. Now come back to Matthew 3 and see what the baptism of fire is. I drew you a picture last night of the baptism of fire. That fellow was immersed. Matthew 3, Matthew 3, 11. Immersion in fire is just what you don't want. Matthew 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water and repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, comma, and with fire. What's the fire? Verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Baptism of fire will damn you in hell. That's what you don't want. Look at verse 10. That is, look on both sides of the verse in the context. You don't see how a fellow get messed up so bad when the verse 4 and a half was a warning. Matthew 3.10, And now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. The baptism of fire is just what you do not want. Make sure you don't get it. Now, we understand what we say. Folks pray and say, Lord, to set us on fire, you know. <laughs> well, I know what you mean. You mean stir us up for the Lord and get us going. See, I understand that. But as a Lord, I just want to be on fire for God. I understand that. You want to be a burning light and a shining light and burn out for the Lord. I understand that. But for goodness sake, don't go around talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. In the first place, it's not the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost, comma, and with fire. And in the second place, no saved person was ever baptized with fire. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now, I'm not saying you might not have had some experience where it felt like you were burning. Now, I'm not saying you might have had some experience where you thought you were immersed in the Holy Spirit. And, yes, I have. <laughs> and I don't very rarely talk about it. I don't very rarely very, very talk about it because I don't want to confuse anybody. But I remember very distinctly, right when I was being saved during that week, when I was praying for about two hours, a very peculiar thing happened, and at the time I thought I was bleeding to death. And I was tasting salt in my mouth. I could taste it, just like blood. And I remember Moody prayed and said, Lord, stop, stop. You know, I didn't pray that. I said, okay, Lord, just turn it on, let's go, and just wind it up. And that was the wrong thing to pray. It turned off. <laughs> and I'm not saying that uh, you should have anything like that. Anybody else should, and I just dropped the matter. And I'm not going to identify that with anything in the Bible. i got better sense. I'm just saying people can have some unusual experience with the Lord. 
but don't ever make your experience the basis of your faith. The Word of God is to be the basis of your faith. You might have another experience contrary to that five weeks later. What would you do then? I mean, I was, uh, I, I should give you a good, good example. Uh, one night uh, I was on a train and uh, had little old uh, David on my lap when he was about two years old. And uh, sitting there with Diana next, next to him, and Diana's about, oh, about seven. And the uh, conductors come in and pick up the tickets. That train going along there, and the babies are all right. About that time, two women in black dresses come in the car, the train the, in the car, and sit down about two seats ahead of us. And David starts screaming and hollering, off goes this shoe and off goes that shoe. Try to get him quiet down. He didn't get quiet down. He's yelling and screaming and hollering and dying all nervous and begin to cry. I take that baby and try to find the shoe. The shoe going off on the floor. Reach down about that time. Tickets. The conductor stand right there over you. Fum around for the ticket and fum around for the shoe. And I'm praying, Lord, so what's the matter, Lord? We get the thing fixed and get the devil out of here. And hand the guy the ticket. And about that time, these two women get up and walk out through the door of that train as they walk around the corner going out the door. Just cuts off like that. The baby just quiet. Not another sound. Not another. Not another. Nothing at all. Perfectly quiet. I'll give you another one. I'm out praying one night behind a trailer with another guy named Wally Trin. We're kneeling out there praying, and it's so dark, and all of a sudden I get this cool, clammy feeling like I'm about to die. And uh, he's kneeling next to me. We're out there in the bushes, and I get up and kind of look around the bushes in the dark, don't see anything. And that thing just gets colder and colder, just like a, like a wet back of an alligator or a serpent. And I begin to plead the blood and look around, don't see anything, and... I started to pray and hold my hands up in the air, and it seemed like if I held my hands up in the air, someone's just going to cut my hands off right at the wrist. Nothing there. And uh, I didn't put my hands up, went on prayed, and after a while the feeling passed away and left. Next day I went out there, we'd been praying, looked around there, and here was a rattlesnake skin, or some snake had shed, about five feet long, lying right there where we'd been praying. Now, I, I could run your list this long, see? Well, I'll tell you what you cannot do. You cannot go by those intuitions and those feelings and things and put them on other people and try to find a Bible basis for them. Because God will not deal with any two people the same way. He won't do it. Some of you might have been in the same place. You wouldn't have felt nothing. I'll give you one more. One night I was coming down late at night, coming back from a place up in Georgia, and Bob Persons was up with me. And every time Bob Purse was with me, something would go wrong. Never was a time. I thought, I don't care what it was. I finally just dropped him as a song leader because well, every time he went along, something... I mean, one time it's a car overturned by the road and Nikolai out there on the highway ready to hijack the car, trying to stop the car. This night we were coming down this big old winding trail in a Georgia mountain at about uh, 2 in the morning. And we came along there in a fog and it got quiet, everybody was asleep, and the old shacks all closed up up and down the mountains, couldn't hear anything. Well, about 2.30 in the morning, I'm in the back seat, I'm beginning to get real nervous, and I just feel like something's going to happen, I don't know what it is, or something, just, just get this kind of a feeling, you know, I have intuition, you know, just like a, just like a woman, even worse, and I have this feeling like uh, something's going to go wrong here, something's the matter, I look over in the front seat, and Bob Person sitting there with this ground on the uh, PA system. We had a PA system on the car. We used to quote scripture, and he's putting this thing on the steering wheel and off, and it's sparking. It's going, <laughs> the spark. And uh, about that time, I heard Bob say, uh, uh, anything wrong? He just nervous the cat. And I said, I don't know what's wrong. I said, put the thing on. Let me quote some scripture. So I put the thing on. We began to quote scripture coming down to these mountains in North Georgia up near, I'm way up there north of Atlanta. And nobody listening, nobody was up. And we went on down, that fog got heavier and heavier and clammier and clammer, and boy, I never had such a feeling all my life, man. It's just like something was over that car just about a minute to take that car and just throw it off the road. He was down to 25 miles an hour. And I was quoting scripture and passed on the blood, you know, and he was praying up in front. About that time, he turned around and said, Pete, let's pray. And I said, okay, man, and flopped that thing off, and both of us began to pray. About that time, coming around a corner up the side of that mountain, here comes a car. And it's got 
real dim orange lights, and it's going like this. You can tell it's an old jalopy, you know, just rattling up the side of that hill. And if that car got closer and closer, that feeling got so bad, you couldn't even pray. Now, there's a, there's a pressure in that place that just choked your mouth. You couldn't get your mouth open. And I sat back and there, I thought, well, here goes something, you know, and here comes this car, 15 miles an hour. I mean, if we hit head on, nobody would have got their neck snapped. And this old thing comes rattling up this hill and goes by us, and as it goes by us with the windows rolled up, you could hear just one voice in that car through both windows rolled up in wintertime. And that car going by, I heard just one voice. And that voice went, ha, 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 like that. Went on by. And when that car went by, that that oppressive spirit just lifted like that. We went right on down the hill. We hadn't driven, I guess, 50 feet, and the Lord said to me, he said, "Uh, there's a dead body in that car. That's all I know, see. I'm not going to run out and jump back and run back and see if there is, and I'm not going to set myself up and say, I have the power to see through closed cars and closed envelopes, and yes, sir, I see, you have gallbladder trouble, send me five dollars, and all that stuff. You know, you know, you know what I mean? You see, the trouble is people go through stuff like that, and then they try to find a Bible basis for it, and they think they're apostles. And that ain't it at all. I've never been kidding myself a bit about it. I just know I'm, I know I'm sensitive to spirit pressure. I'm sensitive to it. And when, when, when the thing is there, I know it's there. When it's not there, I know it's not there. I can't explain it. No way in the world. I couldn't tell you how to find it out. I just, I just know it's there. When I walk into the Bradley's Bible bookstore, that's one spiritual atmosphere. When I come in this room here, that's another one. When you go in a funeral home, that's another one. When you go into a beer joint, that's another one. And I could, I could, I could paint those things. It's so clear. But uh, you say, what do you gather from that? I don't gather anything from it. I just gather you better go by the book. Yes. Yeah, they're saved. Matter of fact, if you want to be technical about it, go back to John chapter 20 and look at verse 22. They've already received the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and this has led to people say, well, you receive the Holy Ghost when you get saved, and then you're baptized with the Holy Ghost after you're saved. See where they get it from? Yes. John chapter 20, verse 22. In uh, Revelation chapter 3, it says, I know the word that thou art neither cold nor hot, or will that thou cold nor hot, or will he talk to you? Spiritually? That the Holy Spirit, if they had the Holy Spirit, they'd be hot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep, yeah, on fire for the Lord, yeah. <laughs> now, you see how folks get in trouble? In John chapter 20, he said they received the Holy Ghost on Acts 2, the baptized. Do you know what they're trying to tell you all this country now? They're trying to tell you you get saved to receive the Holy Spirit, but you don't get the baptism of the Holy Ghost until after you're saved. And to get that, they go over to Acts chapter 19, if you receive the Holy Ghost since you believe. And that all ignores the fact that nothing we're reading yet has anything to do with anybody in this building. Absolutely nothing. Yes. I take for granted they did. Not no way on earth they could be. Christ had no body till after he went back to glory. Yeah, I said a way could have been made for it to start at the cross. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Did they lose it before Act Two? Oh, I suppose they kept it. <laughs> now, how could you, how could you be out of the body and have the Spirit? I mean, yeah, I guess All through the Old Testament. <laughs> All right, turn to 1 Corinthians 12. Now, let me show you where the trouble comes in. After Pentecost, it's never done like this again. In 1 Corinthians 12, look at your case. The Corinthians were Gentiles like you. They were under grace like you. They were after Pentecost like you. And strange enough, the tongues people, they'd swear by Corinthians. Except where I'm getting ready to preach from. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Read it with me together. For 
For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Stop there. Now look at that thing. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Any such thing as a Christian who hasn't got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is that the Holy Ghost? Look at that same chapter where you're reading right there. Look at verse 3. Wherefore I give you understanding, no man is speaking by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus your cursed, and no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of the Lord. Yet any such thing as a Christian who hasn't been baptized by the Holy, by the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that puts the Christian into Jesus Christ. Yes. In other words, they had a spirit out on something like David did. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Not a seal of the lax, too. If what? If it was Satan, can I say that Christ is the Lord except by the Holy Ghost? Well, I'll give you a good case. The nineteen. I'll make it sixteen. And in Acts chapter sixteen. Look at this right, verse uh, seventeen. Here's a demon possessed woman. Tell them the truth. Acts 16, 17, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. But she's demon-possessed. She's preaching the truth, but she's lost and going to hell. Well, I say no man can say that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Not that Jesus Christ is Lord, but that Jesus Christ is the Lord. If anybody confess that Jesus Christ is God Almighty, it's the Holy Spirit that taught him to say that. No man can say that except by the Holy Ghost. But that's no proof of orthodoxy in these other things at all. Uh, if you agree that you should judge your experience by the Bible, yes. Uh, how do you know, and I'm not questioning your experience, but how can you tell that your experience, the thing that you described to us, was of the Lord? I couldn't say absolutely for certain, so I wouldn't say any more about it. Know what I recommend it for anybody else. That's the safe way. That's the safe way. All right, five. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time, this is 33 A.D., same year of the crucifixion, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, that's what they're all concerned about. And they have a right to be concerned about that, and a right to ask that question. And they're not deceived. All the commentaries you pick up say they were deceived about the true spiritual nature of the kingdom. And they asked this carnal question when they were babes in Christ and didn't understand the, the deeper meaning of the kingdom. That's nonsense. Uh, come over here to Daniel and pick up Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel chapter 7... That Jew was told that kingdom would be his and would be restored to him. Daniel 7, verse 13. Daniel 7, 13. Every Jew had a right to expect a literal, physical, political kingdom. Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And it was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Verse 18, But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. They have a perfect right to expect the kingdom to return to Israel. All right, pick up uh, Luke chapter 1. Look at it again. Luke chapter 1. When Christ is uh, born here, look at this prophecy. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. And this is Zechariah prophesying. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Zechariah is filled with the Holy Ghost. Look what he says about the kingdom to Israel. Luke 1, 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David 
how he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we be delivered out of the hand of our enemies. See that thing there? They have every right in the world to expect that kingdom to come to them and then be on top and delivered out of the hands of the, of the Gentile enemies. Yes. Yeah, they're deceived. <laughs> they're deceived. They think the only kingdom promised was a spiritual kingdom. That's denying three-quarters of the Old Testament. Three-quarters of the Old Testament deal with a literal kingdom. All right, Acts 1, 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will about this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said no. He didn't say no. He didn't deny that. He just said it is not for you to know the time of the seasons which the Father put in his own power. That's all he said. He didn't say they wouldn't get it. He didn't say they wouldn't get it then. He just said it's not for you to know about that. But, verse 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, thoroughbred Jew, all Judea, thoroughbred Jew, Samaria, half-breed Jew, the uttermost part of the earth, Gentile. All right, now we're going to... We're going to see why he said it is not for you to know the time and the seasons which the Father has kept in his own power. And we're going to see why one time Christ said of the day and of the hour, no man knoweth, and no man knoweth where the chalk is. I wish uh, I have a box up here with about 30. Oh, here's one right here. Now, I'll tell you what, it, it, I, I can get it if you can keep five in this tray and four in this one and three back here and two in the stand. I can always find one. <laughs> All right, now, the Lord is on the earth 40 days, 40 nights, speaking things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Then he gets ready to go back. The Jews say, well, about this time, restore again the kingdom of Israel. And he doesn't answer them directly. He said, it's not for you to know the time or the seasons. In plain words, the kingdom can come back at any time. And the time and the season are in the Father's power, and only the Father knows when. So when these fellows get preaching, I want to have you look what they're preaching. They're preaching the second coming of Christ. Uh, look at Acts chapter 2. Here's Simon Peter preaching. At Acts chapter 2, look at verse 30. He's preaching Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of David. Acts 2.30, therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Notice David's throne. Verse 34, For David is not ascended to the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou my right hand until I make thine enemy thy footstool. Then Christ is going to come back and sit down on the throne of David at some time. But they don't know the time of the season the Father's got them. Uh, they go right on preaching the second coming. Look at chapter 3, verse 19. They're preaching that Christ was crucified, buried, rose from the dead, and he's coming again. Acts 3, 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive till the time of the restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. And on on they go with that thing. All right, in the book of Acts, then, with that bunch is preaching there, they're preaching, you crucified the king, and the king is coming, the king is coming, get ready, the king is coming. There is any word that you can find in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7 about Jesus Christ dying as a blood atonement to save a man from hell. There's no word there. There's a word that he died, that he was crucified, that he was buried, that he was risen, that he's the Lord, that he's the Christ, that he's the King, and that he's coming back. Nothing there, the blood atonement at all. You don't find one reference in there, like, by grace you're saved through faith, it isn't mentioned. You don't find any reference about uh, justification by faith, it isn't mentioned. 
Christ as a blood atonement for Gentile sinners is not the context of Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. All right, now in Acts chapter 7, something happens, and we'll study this more when we get into it. Right now we're just taking a brief outline. In Acts chapter 7, look at verse 56 to 59, and notice in Acts chapter 7, when uh, Stephen is being stoned, he looks up there in glory and sees Christ at the right hand of God, standing. And all of the place in the Bible he's spoken of is sitting. And in Acts chapter 7, when old Stephen looks up there and sees the Lord standing, they stone him and knock his brains out, and he dies there, and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And boy, in Acts chapter 8, that gospel goes out. Verse 1, Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria. And in Acts chapter 9, Paul gets saved, and under Paul it goes to the end of the earth. So there's a line right there. And up to there, the Lord could have come back at any time. When that thing takes place right there, the Lord switches orders, goes out off another way, and you have another kind of thing coming in. And that's why the heretic will always hang right around Acts chapter 2. Because in a sense, it's almost in, an, in, in another time. In Acts 2, when Peter said, this is that what he's spoken of by the prophet Joel, but it isn't, uh, the, the other half of the prophecy didn't come to pass. Yes, sir. If the Jews had received Christ in Acts 7, Michael the archangel would have seven with the shout, uh, heaven would shout, the voice of the trump of God, and the dead in Christ would have risen up like that. Up like this. Up. The what? Yeah, but that'll be over here at the end. Daniel's 70th week starts here. If they'd accepted him, there'd been a rapture right there spoken of throughout the Old Testament, and after seven years, the Lord would have returned to set up a millennial reign on this earth. And those seven years, the phenomena described in Joel would have all taken place. Spirit poured out in all flesh. Old men see visions, dream dreams. Sun turned to darkness, moon to blood before the great notable day of the Lord. Judas Iscariot would have come up from the bottomless pit and been the Antichrist who sat down in Jerusalem, and the whole Old Testament would have been fulfilled before you were born. Wouldn't have to worry about it, never been written. All you'd have to worry about is the fulfillment of, of the Old Testament prophecies in the second advent. Right, or else just never revealed to anybody. Get it. Lord, just pass it. Body of Christ and Acts 2 would have already been there. Acts 2 to Acts 7. So the type of Eve would have been fulfilled, and the type of Asenath and Rebekah would have been fulfilled. Evidently, the blood atonement isn't revealed to anybody until it's revealed in Africa in Acts chapter 8. When, the, when Philip gets up in the chariot, he hits Isaiah 53 and gets him going, yes. Are there any other prophecies after Acts in the New Testament uh, that differ from the ones in the Old Testament that have to be fulfilled? In other words, well, I'd, have, this place and the I'd, I'd, have, I'd have to think a long time, but it wouldn't make any difference because after Acts chapter 7, the Lord's on another track anyway, and then he can put some other stuff in. Where would the, where would the types of... Uh, Acts 2 to Acts 7. Well, there weren't any Gentiles. Yes, there were. Read Acts 6. The Ethiopian was a... Uh, nope, they're Grecians. Nope, they're Grecians. They're Greeks. They're Greek proselytes, aren't they? Well, yeah, but uh, the bride of Christ has to do with race, not religion. They're Gentiles by race. They're still Japheth. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. Now, you can make spiritual application. You can say, when you get saved, you ought to get power. We'll buy that. We'll say you get your power from the Holy Ghost. We'll buy that. Although you better look out for the expression, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, 
You better look out for that, because he doesn't come upon you, he's in you. Paul said, what? Know you not your body is what? The Holy Ghost is in you. He doesn't come on you. So you can make spiritual application, but boy, the doctrine's rough. You should be witness to me in Jerusalem. That's your hometown. And in all Judea, like the next county. And in Samaria, like the next state. And the uttermost part of the earth, if the Lord leads you over to Japan or India or any other place. You can make spiritual application, but doctrinally it's tough. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men, every angel in that Bible is a man, two men stood by them in white apparel. They could be Moses and Elijah, but the chances are they're two angels, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, not the Holy Spirit, this same Jesus, not another one, this same Jesus, the one with the holes in his hands, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now, the second coming of Christ, that's clear. I mean, someday Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth, and the one that comes back to this earth is going to be the one that walked around that garden and went up to the Mount of Olives that's got holes in his hand and holes in his feet. That's what it's going to be. And the second coming of Christ is not the destructive of Jerusalem. The second coming of Christ is not the Holy Spirit coming. And the second coming of Christ is not Christ coming for a Christian when he dies. The second coming of Christ is the man that died and buried coming back and landing and walking around. Yes. Yeah, that's the advent. Well, is he going uh, to come back in the same manner? Of the of the church? Yes, uh, yes, sir. Zechariah 4. No, the rapture of the church? Yeah. Not something else. Z this passage, turn to Zechariah 14. This passage is Advent. There's not a passage in the rapture. Well, what I mean, will he be in the same bodily form in the rapture as he is here? Well, I don't, I don't know about that. But for the Advent, it's clear. Is he the spiritual being <coughs> towards the rapture? Well, uh, the ma that matter, there's a matter of size, too, which I, I'm not too sure about. My was of the second coming of Christ, the Lord showed his face through the lattice. Be a pretty big face. <laughs> Zechariah 14, now watch this advent. Zechariah 14, 4, and his speech shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. See that? That's right where he went up. He'll come back right where he went up. Land the Mount of Olives. Verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth on that day. There shall be one Lord, and his name one. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Then he's coming back the way he went up. He went up with clouds. He's coming back with clouds. He went up with two men. He's coming back with two men, Moses and Elijah. He went up, so when he's coming back, he's coming down. He went up into heaven. He's coming back down from heaven. When he went up, he went up to the Mount of Olives, verse 12. So when he comes back, he comes back to the Mount of Olives. Then return they to Jerusalem, from the Mount called Olivet. Jerusalem is called the city of the great king in Matthew. And so when the king comes back, he comes back there. I don't. I just said when he went up, he went, two men were there. When he comes back, he comes with back with two men. I know when he comes back, they're Moses and Elijah. I don't know that they're that there. Verse 12, Then return they to Jerusalem to the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey, about 1.5 miles. And when they were come in, they went to an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes. There's that zealot in church history. Simon Zelotes, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the brother of James. That's not Iscariot. That's another Judas. Judas the brother of James. Now mark this next verse. This is the last mention of Mary in your Bible. That's not James the brother of Jesus. No. So it would be another Jude? No, another one. Yep. Well, who wrote the book of Jude? The book of Jude? Was that Jesus' brother? Probably that Jude there. It's James, the Lord's brother. 
Okay, so that Jude that wrote Jude is not the brother of the James that wrote James. No, I don't think so. I think James Zebedee wrote James. All right, verse 14. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, mixed prayer meeting, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Now, it's the last mention of Mary in the Bible. The last time you see Mary, she's in a prayer meeting with a bunch of apostles and disciples, and she is never mentioned again, directly and indirectly. Nobody asks her opinion about anything. Nobody consults her about nothing. Nobody prays to her. Nobody honors her. Nobody reverences her. Nobody says, Blessed Mary. Nobody mentions her birthday. Nobody mentions the birthday of her son. There's another place in the Bible where she's mentioned, and no place in the Bible where anybody mentions Christ's birthday. Nor does anybody ever talk about her being a virgin, or the mother of the Lord, or the mother of God. That's the end of Mary. Finish. <laughs> yes. Mention who? Joseph. The indication is Joseph probably is dead, and she's a widow because at the cross he gave her to John to take home and take care of, which indicates Joseph was probably dead. Aren't supposed what? No. Right in the assembly. Yeah. It doesn't say she was speaking in tongues. It says prayer and supplication. I mean, anything except believe it. Anything except believe it. <laughs> yes. I got a question on that. Uh, if Jesus made me see Christ in Acts chapter 7, then uh, that seven years would not have been tribulation. Uh, Jacob's trouble would have been. Yes. Well, why would they be in trouble if they received because that Roman emperor would have come to Jerusalem and set up an idol and said, bow down, worship the idol. The Jews would worship the idol. He'd turn it on. He'd turn to the persecution. Kill them down to 144,000. <laughs> wow, man. That ain't all Moses and Elijah had to come back to right in the middle of it. Yes. It says, like as a fire, verse 3, like, tongue like as a fire. <laughs> if I think you like something, it's not it. A dog may be like a cat. That's a statement that a dog is not a cat. It's Sir? It's all right, verse 14, these all can with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. Yes. I tell you, I must be confess, be frank with you, brother. When people that get that far out, I'm just actually unable to deal with them. I mean, all I knew there is just quote some verse to them, you know. Like, uh, let God be true to every man a liar, and say, see, it's the man wise is in his own thought of there's more hope for a fool than him. And just uh, just give him something wild. You can't really reason with them. I mean, when people get what they can't read, these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. I didn't say they're going to bed together, all sharing husbands and wives. You can't get that thing out of there unless you're just crazy. I mean, you've got to be way out in the woods to get that, man. You've got to be, I tell you what you've got to be, you've got to be way off over here someplace doing what you want to do, and every time somebody asks you about it, you're reaching back here and trying to find something in the Word of God to justify what you're doing. And not just justifying sin, that's all that business is. That isn't, that isn't Bible study at all. Oh, yeah. There's some dams in there, too. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. <laughs> All right, verse 15. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together are about 120, but there's some kind of a way of counting, see. 
Now, they may not have a roll call and mail your church letter in and send your church letter and all that, but they know how many are there. The number of names, they got a list there. The number of names together, about 120. Wasn't a very accurate secretary, he said about. <laughs> Must have had a couple of absentees or sick or somebody left town or something. The number of names together, about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry. And he's quoting the Old Testament Psalms. What's the cross reference there in the margin? 41.9. 41.9. Uh, now this man purchased a field. He did it by proxy. He didn't actually purchase it. He threw down the money, and the chief priest picked the money up and bought the field. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst asunder, broke in the middle, and his bowels gushed out, everything inside him, the bowel being the inside of anything. And I explained that to you for how it's to be reconciled with Matthew, which says he hung himself. And Matthew says it hung himself in Matthew chapter uh, 27, verse 5, and the way he falls headlong from that gibbet is found in Matthew 27, Matthew 27, verse 52. And the picture is that he goes out and hangs himself, and then when the earthquake starts, he's up here off the rim of Jerusalem, off Gehenna like that, and he's out here hanging himself off a tree out here, and when that earthquake comes, he's torn out off that tree, the limb breaks, the whole tree breaks, and that body goes on down there and busts down to the bottom of the valley. Sir?